This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to the program. I am so excited that today we're going to return to our tour of the ancient city of Ephesus. And today we're going to go to Upper Ephesus and see where some significant New Testament events took place. I want you to see it, to feel it, and to experience it. But it's all in the new series called Take a Tour with Rick. Ephesus, please order this. It's 10 parts. It will feed your spirit and it will feed your mind. And we're also offering you my book, which is called A Light in Darkness. Every Christian needs a copy of this book in their personal library. It will just cause the New Testament to come alive for you. But today we're going to go to Upper Ephesus and I'm going to show you where a monumental event took place in Acts chapter 19 when Jesus met a group of disciples and asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Let's get started. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust. A message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. This week, we've been taking a tour of Ephesus along with Paul and Aquila and Priscilla. In 52 AD, they arrived in the illustrious, legendary city of Ephesus. They made their tour of the lower parts of the city and finally they arrived at the administrative section of the city. And to get here, they had two routes they could take. They could continue walking up Curita Street or they could have taken the Magnesia Road, which I'll show you in just a little while. But if they came up Curita Street, they would have passed the Temple of Dia Roma, they would have passed so many marvelous sights along the way, and finally they would arrive here, which was the amazing Basilica. Today it's in ruins, but even in this ruined state, it is still simply so remarkable. Eventually they would have found themselves standing in the upper section of the city, the administrative district. It was in this privileged section of the city that the local council assembled in the Bulletarion, which was Ephesus' place of government, and the wealthy people shopped in the upper marketplace. Especially privileged citizens bathed in the exclusive baths, and the affluent and influential exercised in the elite upper gymnasium. The upper city was also home to the Temple of Isis, the Pritanium, the Temple of Diaroma, and the Magnesia Gate. When Paul and his team entered the upper administrative district, they would have visited the Basilica, which is where I am right now. It was one of the most magnificent buildings in Ephesus. Built in 11 AD, this majestic 490 foot long building was expanded by Nero and graced with columns crowned with Corinthian capitals, giving a cathedral-like feel to its interior. As a visitor entered the building, they saw two impressive rows of 67 ionic columns, a total of 134 columns topped with two projecting bulls on either side gave the impression of great power. And it's important to know the symbol of a bull was also an important emblem in cult worship, symbolizing both power and fertility. The vast number and strategic location of these 268 bulls also conveyed the message that the basilica was used also for this purpose. The people who strolled through the basilica were dressed in garments embroidered with gold to signify their high social status. Women's faces were covered with cosmetics, which was a very expensive product in the first century, and their hair was elaborately braided with strands of pure gold woven in the locks of their hair. Earrings, rings, arm bracelets, and jewelry worn on these wealthy women's ankles and feet were fashioned of gold and silver, making it apparent they were accustomed to luxury. In the Basilica and administrative district, it was evident that even the men were accustomed to a higher lifestyle. 
The men wore expensive flowing garments as they strolled through the art styles, exchanging ideas about business and politics. The elite socialized with each other, voicing their support and objection to ideas, or they listened to their educated acquaintances who also lived in the upper district of Ephesus. At the very end of the basilica were two statues of the Emperor Augustus and Empress Livia. They were placed on large podiums in the East Annex, and the walls of the basilica were lined with portraits and inscriptions of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. If Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla strolled through the basilica, which I'm sure they did, they would have stopped along the way to look at all these amazing sights. And along the way, they would have noticed several doors to the left, which led into the bulletarium. If Paul and his team entered the bulletarium, it may have been through this very door. They would have come this way like all the local city senators, or they may have come from the other side through an arched entrance, which came from the side of the Temple of Diaroma. But when they came into this place, they would have stopped here to burn incense to the emperor, and this is where his statue was erected. By the way, the word bulletarian is from the Greek word bulomai. The word bulomai means I counsel. These were city counselors. And at the time that the apostolic team first arrived in Ephesus, there were 450 of them. And because these were city councilmen, of course, they would have stopped to worship the emperor. So here they would have burned a pinch of incense or they would have worshiped the emperor. And from this point, they could have turned to walk up the steps to the upper part of the bulletarian. Or they could have chosen to go this way to enter the bulletarian from this direction. The building visible today is the result of an expansion carried out in 150 AD. But when Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla came to Ephesus, they saw an earlier version of it. It was the location where city senators or city councilmen met. These senators were elected from high-ranking, distinguished families, and each was required to earn a higher education and to use his influence to help rule and govern life in Ephesus. After the year 150 AD, this building was expanded to accommodate 1,400 people and was also used as a concert hall called the Odeon. The bigger population of Ephesus attended shows in the Great Theater, but the rich class liked to stay close to the upper part of the city. And as an Odeon, it was used to hold musical, theatrical, and dramatic performances, especially for the upper class that rarely attended events in the Great Theater. The Odeon consisted of three main sections, the auditorium, the orchestra, and a two-storied marble backdrop for the stage, which was decorated with elegant statues and intricate carvings. Patrons reached their seats by climbing multiple sets of stairs. And when it was used as a concert hall, it had a stretched canvas roof to protect patrons from the sun or foul weather. The apostolic team arrived in the upper part of the city, regardless of which way they arrived here, eventually they came to these four columns, which are located on the Magnesia Road, which was the most important road in the upper part of the city. And these four columns were the entryway to the upper marketplace, and they were erected in the first century BC and later when the upper marketplace was renovated, these four columns remained in their original position. And we know for certain that Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla would have entered through those central two columns. Now, it's likely that Aquila did not join them. She must have stopped right here to wait because women were not allowed in marketplaces. But Paul and Aquila ventured right through those central two columns into the upper marketplace. It measured 480 feet by 168 feet and was absolutely the most impressive market in Ephesus. Paul had seen marketplaces in Tarsus, 
Antioch, Jerusalem, Athens, and Corinth. But what he and his team saw here was different from any market they'd ever seen before. The magnificent marketplace was constructed during the reign of the Emperor Augustus, and it was largely expanded during the reign of the Emperor Claudius, who was still ruling when Paul's apostolic team first arrived in Ephesus. Three sides of this ancient market were lined with 150 marble columns, each capped with carved capitals. Graves and crypts were scattered throughout the marketplace, not tombs of commoners, but of well-known citizens, some dating more than 700 years before the birth of Christ. So you see, this wasn't just a shopping center. It was also a necropolis, an ancient cemetery that was designed to honor the illustrious dead of Ephesus. Paul must have been shocked to see shoppers meandering among shops that were interspersed with the graves of historical giants, including scholars, historians, writers, poets, philosophers, politicians, and statesmen. History abounded on every side in this city, but especially in the upper marketplace of Ephesus. As Paul and Aquila meandered through the upper marketplace, they would have seen in the very center of it, the Temple of Isis. These broken fragments is all that remains of the columns from the Temple of Isis. And they're a long way from home because this is red granite from Aswan in Egypt. These columns were carved in Aswan. They were put on ships that sailed down the Nile to the Delta sailed into the Mediterranean, finally up across the Aegean Sea where it came to the Keister River, sailed all five miles up the Keister River to the man-made harbor of Ephesus, and then they were carried all the way up to the hill to this location where they were erected to form the Temple of Isis. High walls surrounded the temple's exterior. They were erected to keep the curious eyes of the outside world from viewing the secret rites that transpired deep inside the inner part of this deep, dark, mysterious sanctuary. Just as the cult of Serapis attracted men, the worship of Isis attracted women. The highly visible location of this temple is evidence about the popularity of this cult in the city of Ephesus. And it's entirely possible that Paul and his team saw this temple of Isis as they surveyed the upper marketplace. Egyptian cults were first carried to distant lands after Alexander the Great was declared Pharaoh of Egypt in 332 BC. And it was during that time that Egyptians carried the husband and wife cult of Serapis and Isis to Ephesus then on into other parts of Asia Minor, where this religion played a major role in the province. But this cult especially appealed to people of education and wealth. And maybe that's because of Cleopatra's influence on the Greeks and the Egyptians in the city of Ephesus. Cleopatra's dedication to the goddess Isis was widely known all over the Roman Empire. She even adorned herself as the high priestess of Isis, wearing a headdress and priestly clothing to make her appear as if she was the goddess herself. And as I told you earlier, Cleopatra and Antony wintered in Ephesus in the year 33 BC. And some scholars say the temples of Isis and Serapis in Ephesus were erected because of Cleopatra's visit to Ephesus and her great influence in this city. But the Temple of Isis had 16 tall columns and exotic music played as incense billowed into the air from the altars where worshipers gathered to show reverence to the gods. Unlike other temples in Ephesus where people could freely walk in from the street to offer incense or view the proceedings, the activities inside the Temple of Isis were hidden from public view. The temple was a place where dark, secret rites were conducted behind its tall walls using fire, water, incense, and other elements known to be associated with the occult. 
If Paul and his team walked the perimeter of the Temple of Isis, they could have seen Greek and Egyptian inscriptions on the outside of a tall wall that surrounded the complex. From behind the walls, they would have heard the sounds of exotic music and clacking castanets. The team would have smelled the smoke of sacrificial incense as it seeped over the walls of that secret shrine. In every way, the cults of Isis and Serapis were mysterious, dark, and demonic. Directly behind me is what is called the Magnesia Road. It begins at the Magnesia Gate, which is the gate for the upper part of the city. It meanders all the way down this side of the marketplace, then turns onto what later was renamed the Road of Domitian. And it is a road which leads right along the Temple of Domitian, and that's very important. This was the main upper road as people entered the city. And during the time that the Apostle John was here, when the Emperor Domitian was ruling the Roman Empire, people were required to enter the city from the upper gate on this road. Can you imagine? Millions of people walked on this road, then turned at this intersection and walked past the Temple of Domitian into Domitian Square, and that meant they had to stop at the Temple of Domitian to worship, to burn incense to his image before they could continue on into the city of Ephesus. But when Paul and his team arrived in Ephesus, this street was highly decorated with statues, idols, and pagan gods which were colorfully painted to make their appearance seem lifelike to observers. If the apostolic team walked eventually to the gate of Magnesia, it would have completed their tour of the central part of Ephesus. The gate of Magnesia was simply breathtaking. And from that gate, a road led to the great temple of Artemis, circling around the base of a mountain along the way. When Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla arrived in Ephesus, the worship of Artemis was deeply embedded in the lives of the Ephesian people. But if Paul and his team traveled this road, they would have eventually reached the temple of Artemis, one of the most famous temples of ancient times and listed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. After their initial arrival in Ephesus in 52 AD, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 18 that Paul left Aquila and Priscilla here by themselves for a brief period of time and he went on to Jerusalem, but finally he returned. And when he returned to Ephesus, he did not come by ship. He re-entered the city through the Magnesia Gate and walked on this upper road. This is recorded in Acts chapter 19, verse one. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. Now you probably know this story, but listen to this. The Bible says, he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we've not so much heard as whether there is anything called the Holy Ghost. He said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John barely baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. That entire event occurred on this road. Aquila and Priscilla had continued their ministry in the lower section of Ephesus near Philosopher's Square and where the open air synagogue was located. But when Paul came back to town, he didn't come from that direction, he came from this direction, the upper region of the city where he encountered these Jewish men who had believed in the baptism of John. What does that mean? They heard John preach, possibly while they were on a trip to Israel. And John preached, someday a Messiah is coming, be baptized by faith, believe in the one that is to come, and they were baptized believing that one day the Messiah would come and then they returned home to Ephesus and never heard the good news that the Messiah came. So when John found them on this road, he said to them, what kind of baptism did you receive? They said John's baptism. 
telling us to believe in the one that is to come. And Paul said, guys, 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 I need to tell you something. He came. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And they rejoiced when they heard Paul's message. They were baptized in water. Paul laid his hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. That entire event happened right on this Magnesia Road. People often call or write to ask, when will Rick take his next tour group to Ephesus? We want to go. So many people have made this request that Rick decided to bring Ephesus to you in the new series, Take a Tour with Rick, Ephesus. After years of praying and planning, Rick finally went to Ephesus to film this personal tour for you. And he gives the entire tour through the eyes of the Apostle Paul and Aquila and Priscilla as they saw Ephesus when they first arrived there to start the church at Ephesus. With permission from local authorities, even off-limit sites were open to Rick so he could take his film crew to show you sites that even tourists are not able to see. This is truly a one-of-a-kind tour, but it's not just a tour. As Rick walks you through the paths of Ephesus, he teaches all along the way. This 10-part documentary-type visual series is available in digital or physical formats starting at just $20. We're also offering you the book, A Light in Darkness, this beautiful 800-page book features on-location photography with added artwork and illustrations to enhance the in-depth scriptural teaching that makes the early New Testament come alive on every page. Rick reveals insights into the ancient world and the disturbing realities that early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a pagan world. This book is available right now for just $80. Don't miss this special offer. The visual series Take a Tour with Rick, Ephesus, and the book A Light in Darkness. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I want to give you a report about what's happening in the construction of our new studio. Work still continues. It's taken a little bit longer than we anticipated because of all the sanctions that have stopped materials from coming to Russia, but we're doing it step by step. And today they're installing the fireplace, which is going to be the centerpiece of this big room where we're going to be filming programs. But in addition to this, there's gonna be another set over here and another set over there. So many angles and opportunities to film teaching that people can trust in this room. But of course, this is just one room. But I have to tell you, I'm pretty excited about this room. To think that TV programs with the Word of God are going to be filmed right here. And when I look around this room, you can see this electrical grid, grid that's gonna hold all the lights. It's on electrical pulleys, so it goes up, it goes down. It's just going to have everything we need to film the teaching of the Word of God. But hey, there's more than this. Let me show you. Well, I know you can't tell from what it looks like right now, but this really is gonna be one of the smaller studios. And this is gonna be Denise's studio. 
because Denise is reaching women everywhere with her programming. And right from this spot, Denise is going to be sending her teaching to women all over the world. But hey, there's another set in addition to this one. This is our third studio in this new building. You may say, why do you need three studios? Because we're filming a lot of programs. Right now, we can only film one program at a time. We have to set it up, take it down, but this will enable us to do multiple things at one time. But on both floors of this building, there are multiple offices. In fact, there are 18 offices, and in all of these offices, people are going to be doing editing, writing, producing programs, working with our network. It is amazing the activity that's going to take place in this building. And it's not about buildings, it's about people. People need the teaching of the Word of God. But it's your generous gifts that have helped us to build this and we will complete it. But right now we're in phase three of our ministry, which is paying off our Tulsa ministry headquarters. We wanna pay it off because the moment it's paid off, all of those funds will be released for us to broadcast the teaching of the Word of God around the world. And that's really our goal, to get the gospel and to teach people the Bible all over the world. They're just crying out for it, and they're waiting for that signal to come with the answer that they've been seeking. So please help us as we finish phase three to pay off the Tulsa facility. My friend, today we have covered a lot of material, but tomorrow when we return, I'm going to take you to the place where the Apostle John lived in the city of Ephesus. You can still go to that place. And I'm going to take you to a house which allegedly is where the Virgin Mary lived while she resided in the city of Ephesus. And then I'm going to take you to the ruins of the great temple of Artemis. And my friend, I want to hear from you if you're enjoying this series because we really prepared this tour just for you. And I want you to have the whole series, which is called Take a Tour with Rick Ephesus. It's 10 parts. And my friends, it is just so amazing. You will literally walk into the New Testament church. So please order this by going online or by giving us a call. And right now we're also offering you the accompanying book, which is called A Light in Darkness, Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. You need this book. Actually, I believe that every believer ought to have this book in their house because it really gives you a snapshot, a view into the world of the first century, which was so similar to what we're dealing with today. So please order this by going online or by giving us a call and let us know how to pray for you by reaching out to us right now. But Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the wonderful word of God. And we truly thank you that where the word of a king is, there's power. And I speak the power of your word into my friend's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.